All right, we are recording. We're back. <laughs> so, uh, welcome back. So, uh, uh, once again, my name is Adam Hersberger, and with me is my colleague, yeah. Josh Williamson. <laughs> and we took a little break during the summer months, uh, you know, family things. I was teaching a summer course, and, uh, and it, it's, it's fine. Um, we, we just thought that we would um, sort of tune back in and give you some updates on what's going on on Albright's campus and, you know, a larger big picture view of the pandemic and, and any, you know, important updates that have happened uh, since, since uh, the last episode was released. So Josh, so where do you want to start? Like what, what is, in, in, in your mind, what are some of the big new advances since say in the last two months? Well, I think um, the biggest thing in the last two months is that um, my hopes for where we would be with this pandemic is we're shattered, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and basically the, the, pan the virus has just slowly and methodically marched to, um, across the globe and across the United States. Um, currently, it, we're getting over the fact that it's marched from the east side of Pennsylvania to the west side of Pennsylvania. Um, and, and so today, actually, I was looking at um, parts of the country that haven't been hit yet, you know, because it's, it just seems like it's a matter of time where this, um, this virus eventually gets, um, gets to all these places. So we went through our big um, wave uh, in Berks County and in eastern Pennsylvania um, several months ago, uh, but now other parts of the country are going through it as well. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this at a previous in, in a previous episode or not. I've said it m many times, but um, in, early on in the pandemic, um, a doctor out in the Midwest said that it's like waiting for a tidal wave of waiting for a tidal wave of molasses. <laughs> you just, it's coming. You know, it's coming. It's just coming so slow. Um, which, which you know, in reality, it's not. I mean, this thing is <laughs> as. Uh, traveled the globe uh, in just a few short months and, and wreaked havoc on everywhere. Um, but that's, uh, that's, I think, the biggest news is that it's, it's um, hit all these different places. Um, right now, uh, currently, Louisiana is seeing it spread into um, more of the um, um, smaller areas of the state, not just they had the big spike in New Orleans, but now it's hitting smaller parishes across the state. So their numbers are up, um, but that's um, that's I think the the big news. Um, unfortunately, we're also in a place where we haven't seen uh, dramatic effects with treatment, and I think part of that is we're still we're still parsing out the disease course, um, still trying to to figure it out. And there's a lot of interesting information out there as to why that is. Um, there's a couple very, very small studies and case reports of some genetic um, susceptibility. Um, probably not a main driver in what's going on, but hopefully um, with that information, it'll help us understand the disease course a little better. Right. Um, phase three trial on a vaccine um, started recently, so that's, um, that's very exciting. So hopefully, um, hopefully they're making good headway with, um, with that treatment course. Right. So, yeah, so just so people are aware, phase three is typically the phase where they start to look at um, what people call eff efficacy. Sorry, that's a tough, tough word to say, efficacy. Um, so, you know, basically, how good is it? Right. So that's, you know, the gold standard test is um, a double blind placebo control type type of situation where you maybe have one arm of the study that has a placebo shot or, you know, pill in this case, probably a shot. And then another group that actually has the vaccine formulation and you just track the two groups and look to see is the uh, rate of acquisition of infection hopefully lower in the vaccine arm uh, versus the placebo. And then you can do some uh, stats on that and figure out, you know, you sort of put a percentage on it. How good is this at reducing the risk of infection? So um, unfortunately those studies are, they, they, they tend to be, and, and this is often like the, the, the slowest part and, and it's just so um it just kind of kills me because we we all want a vaccine like yesterday you know 
And it's, it, it's the one part of clinical trials that tends to take a long time because you just have to, you know, you just treat people and you have to wait, you know, for a certain amount of time um, to, to see if that rate of, rate of acquisition of infection is, is the same. Is it different between the placebo and the vaccine group? And it just takes time. You know, phase one and two tend to be about, you know, dosing and uh, safety and immune response type, type questions. You know, does it generate antibodies? Are there any adverse reactions? You know, and then they scale it up typically to a phase three, which is the effectiveness part. And so it's kind of a waiting game to wait for that data to trickle in. And, uh, but there's, I mean, it's, it, it's too much detail to go into all the different formulations, but there's at least five or six that I've been tracking that have made it to at least phase two, phase three. Um, so hopefully, uh, as Dr. Fauci has mentioned, hopefully by uh, like sometime in the winter, maybe early 2021, we'll have something that we can start to give to people. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're at, right, Josh? Yeah. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, but I mean, fr from some of the early reports, I mean, some of these vaccine formulations um, are inducing strong immune responses. They are generating antibodies uh, and also T cell responses, um, parts of the immune system that help you know, control infections. They are being generated and in some cases to even higher levels than what are seen from like the natural course of infection from like survivors of this who are, you know, their immune responses are, are measured after they, they, they clear the virus. So um, there is some good news on that front, I think. Um, and I haven't seen much in the way of um, uh, worrisome side effects either to this mm -hmm. point, right, Adam? No, not to this point, no. I, I just, sorry, I, I should put down my, uh, my shade. <laughs> <laughs> it, look, it looks like I'm in, like very angelic, right, with the, with the glow <laughs> behind my head. I was wondering why it was rectangular and not uh, round. <laughs> um, this is my first recording in my office. Um, so I, I noticed. It's nice, nice to be back here instead of either sitting on the floor of my bedroom while my kids are being loud downstairs, right? So I have to sort of seclude myself in my bedroom. Um, <laughs> A couple of our episodes I'm recording at the dining room table. Um, so <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So yeah. So so there is some hope there with the vaccines. Um, I mean, so, so so I was hoping you'd actually be able to comment. So as far as I can tell, um, hydroxychloroquine seems to be, in my opinion, like finished. Right. I I mean, in, in, unless there's something that you've seen, um, it doesn't really seem to have an effect. It's been shown multiple times. I, I, I think that's probably put to bed. Like, what do you think? I think from a medical standpoint, um, it, it doesn't look good. Um, I just had to have the conversation with my father because he doesn't understand why uh, there's such reluctance um, in the medical community about supporting this medication. And I had to explain to him that, you know, that it, this is very difficult, you know, um, um, and, and I don't, I, I, I don't want to say that I would shut the door on any treatment right now because, sure. but because I think the biggest, this is what I told him. The biggest problem right now is that we're still trying to define the disease course. We're still trying to parse out the difference between the, the, the problems that you, the patients are getting from the immune response compared to the infection of the virus itself. We're still trying to understand how it affects each organ system. Uh, there's a lot of work going on there, and and maybe maybe hydroxychloroquine will have uh, an effect for people with this particular um, manifestation of symptoms from the virus. Uh, you know, maybe, but but you're right. It's it's not the the data so far is not looking good, especially for hospitalized patients, especially for keeping them from uh, progression of disease or or from dying. Um, in fact, we mentioned the the, um, the solidarity trial from the, the World Health Organization, um, and it didn't take them very long to to drop that arm of the trial um, because just because the, the patients weren't doing well. Right, right. and that is pretty common. Uh, just so people are aware, there's always uh, sort of like um, intermittent analysis that goes on during these trials. So you have an independent, uh, you know, usually like an independent some kind of review board that every so often they periodically review the data because what you don't want to see happen is the treatment actually make things worse. And so that's why you have these regular check-ins to see, you know, is it, if it's making it worse, then you can halt the trial. Or, um, or if it's not having any effect at all, 
then perhaps he can also halt the trial then as well. But definitely, definitely if it's having a harm. And I don't think hydroxychloroquine- Or if another arm is doing so well, so he won't, want to, he won't want to withhold. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. No, I'm sorry. Um, or if, an, uh, if another treatment is doing so well, then you want to switch all the patients to the treatment that, that is doing so well to try to- Right on the flip side, right? If it's really doing well, and everyone's, I like, say, getting cured, then you could halt and give the placebo people, let's say, the actual drug. Exactly. You can go both ways. And I'm not trying to suggest, by the way, that hydroxychloroquine is causing people to, I, I haven't seen data where it's really causing harm, per se, although it, it's hard to know for individual patients, but in general, it doesn't really seem to show up benefit. Um, so, um, and also there's a recent study in in vitro uh, where some researchers um, took, like, a common cell line that people typically use in the lab, they're, they're called a Vero. So they come from an African green monkey, um, I believe, or a civet, uh, something like that. But you know, it, it, it's coming from a non-human primate, um, like a kidney epithelial cell, right? And hydroxychloroquine does inhibit replication of, of SARS-CoV-2 in those cells. But when they had a, um, uh, what, what, what they call like a, um, I, I, think it, I think they used a, um, airway epithelial, um, um, you know, they tried to mimic a, a, a human airway epithelial layer. And so they have this like liquid air interface that these cells growing in a very particular way to try to, it, it actually causes them to differentiate, to become uh, more like an actual airway cell. And in those cells, the, 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 uh, the drug was found to have no effect. Um, and so in, in, in a cell that is much more closely mimicking what the virus would actually see in a person with these human airway cells in vitro and you know in a test tube um, it had it had no effect so I, I you know I think I would trust that data a little bit more than, than coming out of the you know the monkey cells right um, so there's that data uh, you know in vitro along with the studies that have gone on hydroxychloroquine. and like I said I, I think at this point most people are not trying that anymore um, uh, some some other updates so um, remdesivir, which is something we discussed previously, that's an actual antiviral drug. So that targets one of the enzymes of the virus to kind of halt it from growing. That has still shown to my knowledge some benefit, especially in severe um, infections. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's still, there, there's still some evidence like uh, shortened hospital duration or um, like lower death rate or something like that. Do you have any updates on that one, Josh? No, you're, I think you're right though. I think that's the last information I saw um, on, on that as well. Now the unfortunate thing, that, that is administered IV, correct? Right, so that's gonna limit its usage in, in, unless you're basing a hospital. Um, right, so, right, so that's remdesivir. I think there is some, you know, it might help some people. And the other one is what, dexamethasone? Is, uh, that's a, uh, that's a, um, <coughs> right, correct? Yes. There's been some evidence that that can be helpful as well. Uh, do you know anything more about that? And again, that, that goes back to um, the timing of treatment and where the patient is in the disease course and, and which, which effect of the, um, um, of the infection has on their body. So the dexamethasone is used commonly for um, a lot of infections to halt that cytokine storm that we've talked about in the past. Um, so kind of the idea is that maybe the antiviral medicine early on uh, will help the body um, block replication, uh, and then the dexamethasone maybe uh, later in the disease course when the, when the patient's immune system is causing so much problems. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's spot on, yep. And, so, and, but, but and again, just, been, sorry, go on. No, no, I was just gonna say, uh, unfortunately it's still, you know, um, still, they're still, teasing that stuff out and and, um, and so um, there are a lot of treatment courses described and being looked at but again it's going to take time till we you know can can tease out that this treatment is best for this patient at this time right right it's a, yeah it's a it's a shame after six plus months right roughly and uh, at this point what today we have 18 million people worldwide infected that um, despite the incredible amount of work by so many people and all and all their effort it's a shame that we still don't have some hard and fast answers yet. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it, it just shows you how um, hard basic research is, right? Basic science research, basic medical research, um, especially when you're dealing with, with live patients, right? Like human bodies, everyone, like every single one of us is different. And so 
the infection course could be slightly different. The way a drug reacts in our bodies could be slightly different. And so it's really hard. Um, if you, yeah, so you mentioned about the cytokine storm and things like that. Since the last time we had an episode, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, some of the early things we've been discussing are still true. Um, the initial phase of infection is, you know, you have rampant, just a ton of virus replication going on in the um, airway. Um, they can detect um, virus by a nucleic acid testing. So, you know, like nasal swab and PCR, they can detect it um, in the airway and in, even in the feces, right? And, and, and things like that at different, different spots. Um, and then it seems that there's sort of like a lull where the, a lot of patients seem to start to get a little better. They start to feel a little bit better. And at this point, we're probably like a week to two weeks into the infection. And then week two to three, you've got this cytokine storm that, that, that you brought up, Josh, that it seems that in some people, uh, most of the pathology, most of the disease is caused by this overactive immune response. And then on top of that, starting about week four or so, um, on average, then you start to have some people are experiencing basically like uh, clotting or coagulation issues that are leading to cardiovascular manifestations and a host of other issues. I, I, I brought that up in, in, you know, in the hopes that maybe you would have some insight on that, Josh, or is that something that you've been tracking or you have any more, um, you know, sort of insight on that? Um, no, not too much to add that way. Uh, there was some interesting um, information about the cardiac effects. That's a, as all these patients recover from the illness, um, we're getting, there is some more information uh, about those effects. So now there's a big concern about um, how, how much of the heart has been affected for a lot of these patients. Um, I think one of the studies um, I looked at um, quoted a, um, above 50% of patients um, having significant um, heart pro problems afterwards. It appears that, um, so in fact, one of the guidelines talk about treating patients who recover from COVID um, as if they are recovering from a cardiomyopathy. So really limiting their, um, limiting their uh, aerobic activity um, because they're at risk for having a heart attack uh, in that recovery phase. And so, um, so there, are, there are specific guidelines about that. Uh, and the question now is, you know, does everybody that, um, that's had COVID need to get a stress test before they get back to full exercise? Uh, or can you just follow troponin? Troponin is something that's um, uh, been measured and, and, and followed and seems to be a pretty good indicator right now. So there is a blood test that you can get to see if your heart's um, affected while you're, when you're hospitalized. And then, um, and then afterwards, they can, they, that's something that they've been looking at as far as tracking. And that's um, indicative of heart, like um, actual muscle heart damage, right? Yes, yeah, heart damage. Um, and so they've been looking at um, um, cardiac MRIs um, to, to look for heart damage. They actually found that um, it seems like the inflammation is not in the myocyte itself, um, but in the, in, I, I guess, in the interstitium of, uh, of, the, um, of the heart. So, so it's a little... So probably like maybe like... Um... Um, epithelial cells, fibroblasts, like some of the, I guess, some of the support cells, I guess. Fibrogla fibroblasts and then uh, macrophages uh, okay. infiltra infiltrating as well. Okay. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that it's, um, because there are viruses that, that can attack the heart muscle, um, but this seems to be a different disease process from, from what, um, what we're used to with that. Right. We're so still trying it's to, kind of interesting. We're still, we're still trying to figure that out. I agree, Josh. Um, I haven't seen any data yet um, about actual like virus replication. Uh, you know, it is hard. It is hard to do those studies because in order to do that, in order to be approved for that, uh, it's my understanding that the lab needs to have a BSL three facility, which is you know um, a sort of one step down from like the moon suits that you see on the movie Outbreak, right? Um, but you still need to put like a gown on, and you need to have a special facility and like negative pressure and like all these all these um, precautions you still need to take. Um, and so not every lab has that. Like Albright doesn't have a BSL-3 lab, right? Um, the closest BSL-3 lab I'm aware of is down at, down at Penn, you know? Um, you know, so you just can't like take the virus 
from say a patient swab and just put it in on cells in the lab that you have next door, you know, typically. Um, I have how, seen, how difficult is that then, Adam? I mean, how, I would imagine that's gotta be tough to quantify that kind of information. I, 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 mean, I think the hardest thing is probably the facility itself to actually have the funds and the resources to have one. <laughs> okay. I mean, what, what, once you have that, I mean, you know, I mean, we used to grow stuff from, uh, Mice. So, you know, my, you know, like in my postdoc, we would try to grow virus from, from infected mice sometimes. And I mean, it's easier in a mouse, of course, right? But you can imagine if you could take a, a biopsy of some sort from a tissue, you can literally just sort of grind it up and just literally just sort of add some of it to cells that you know can be infected with SARS-CoV-2 and just look to, to see if there's infection going on in those cells, right? If there's no live replicating virus, then, then the cells will look healthy and, and you know, but there's a there's a term that people use in the field. It's called it's called the cytopathic effect, or 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 a CPE for short. And basically, it's a hallmark of viral infections that cells just basically look sick. Um, they just look different. And if you were to add it, they'll they'll they'll, they'll show that CPE. And often too, some viruses um, will form what's called a plaque, which is basically you have cells growing like in a flat layer, and then they'll form these holes where the virus is destroying the cells. And then you can see those holes are they're called plaques and you can just sort of count them and, and try to get a rough estimate how much virus is actually there um, so so that the actual like lab work part of it i don't think is extremely difficult you can even do it from a swab right you can imagine you could take take a swab or even from saliva and mix it with maybe some saline or something kind of switch that swab around and then just add it to the cells and just see if any virus grows you know i mean that's my understanding about what what you do um, you know, very like fundamental level, but um, so I don't know if there's any been any virus cultured from the heart. I mean, studies that I've seen, they can find RNA in the blood, meaning if they do a very sensitive molecular um, uh, PCR based test, they can find viral like genomes or parts of genome, like, you know, but whether it's infectious virus, I, I haven't seen that being answered in the affirmative. I don't know if there's live virus in the blood but they can detect legacy parts of virus in, in the blood, but whether it's actually from like an intact, like infectious virus particle, I haven't seen that um, in, you know, in the affirmative yet. Um, same, same, same from stool. You can, you get PCR positivity from stool from somebody that's in a hospital um, or in the early phases of infection, but they haven't been able to find cultured virus yet from stool. So anyway, um, there's, there's still a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, so, so, so like you said, there's something different going on. It's not like a Coxsackie virus, which actually does legitimately infect the heart muscle um, or the valves or, you know, whatever it might be, um, or a bacteria that is like Staph aureus that is literally growing on the valves and forming a biofilm. Um, I, I have not seen data yet showing um, that it is actually like um, actually replicating in the, in the heart or um, even in the vessels, right? So, so maybe Josh, this is probably a good time to just mention briefly. Um, so we had an email um, in the last couple of weeks from uh, Kelly. I don't know how to pronounce. Is it is it Tanger, Josh? Do you know? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so I apologize, Kelly, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, she wrote us an email. She's um, an uh, administrative assistant over in Masters Hall here on campus, and she wrote us a, a nice, very thoughtful email about. Um, about you know the disease itself and and how of course it's a respiratory disease, but also there's been some evidence that it's bit, you know uh, maybe like a vascular disease as well. And so she passed along some information and was asking us to, to comment on that. So we I was trying to kind of work it in uh, to our conversation today. Um, but I think that brings up kind of like you know later on in infection we're talking like because um, I've been following some some podcasts of some infectious disease doctors and things and. And it does seem that about um, four to five weeks after you initially test positive and have your disease course, that some people come down with these like, you know, coagulation issues and clotting issues and uh, this like vascular disease. Some, some children you may have seen in the news, um, this like Kawasaki-like um, disease, which is essentially an inflammation of, of the lining of blood vessels. So once again, I don't think it's the virus actually infecting those cells, but I don't know for sure I have a funny feeling it's an offshoot or byproduct of the, of the inflammation, right? Of all those like, like immune cytokines and, 
uh, all, all these inflammatory molecules that are that are floating around the body because of the virus, right? So that, that like I said, that that's just my take on it as a as a biologist who's who's trying to keep up with this all. Um, but I wanted to get your take on that, Josh. Now again, um, it's affecting every organ system. Is is what I'm is what I'm seeing, um, and and so each of those different effects are happening for different reasons. And and so, um, like you mentioned, the, the 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 basic science part of it is the most important thing to me right now because you know we're trying to trying to sort that out. Does the virus do this? Does it do that? Um, and then, um, and then the role of the immune system um, causing the problems. So, um, no, I uh, I don't have. I, I think you stated it very well, and I uh, I don't really have anything to add on that. Um, yeah, you know, because, and the reason I ask is we don't always read the same papers, right? Like, you know, there's right. so much information yeah. coming out on a daily basis. It's hard to keep up with it all. But, uh, right. but between the two of us, you know, we get a good glimpse of it. Well, and when you were talking about the diff the epithelial cells and the kidney cells, I was uh, there was a paper about um, um, I think they were corneal cells because it was a question of does the is the virus able to penetrate the eye, right. um, and there was there was the um, there was some debate about you know is this was the study it was thought to be a pretty good study but you know they can't don't take into effect um, or can't, didn't take into account or the effect uh, of tearing in the eye. And there's just a lot of different barriers that the eye has that, that that's different from um, the, re the rest of the respiratory system or, um, or the GI tract. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's hard to, it's, yeah, they, I mean, they do as good a job as they can to, to replicate the actual structure, but you're right. It's, you know, in a plastic dish, it's impossible to, to mimic it completely. Um, but you'd see, you know, you do the best you can. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, and that brings up, so the IL-6 inhibitor, um, Texa, uh, blah, I can't, it's like alphabet soup, but it's <laughs> with a T. Let, let, let me look that up real quick so that I, um, so IL-6 inhibitor. I used to keep my list here next to me oh. because uh, sometimes you would throw that out and I, I wanted to jump on top of it, but I don't have it with me. <laughs> yes. Uh, of course, it's not coming up immediately. Google, don't let me down. Um, it, I know it begins with a T. Um, okay, yeah, I'm not seeing it pop right up. But um, they, oh, here. To less, to less severe or to. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tosilimumab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't quite, I wasn't close enough. <laughs> yeah, T-O-C-I-L-I-Z-U-M-A-B. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's an, a monoclonal antibody that, get, that gets injected. And uh, I, there has been some promising data on there. Once again, not like a, a cure but it, it has been shown in some people to reduce um, hospital stay, potentially a positive effect on death rates. Um, the idea being that at least in some people, right, once again, probably not everybody, but in a subset, um, it's the idea is it's gonna try to dampen some of that, that over um, active immune response, because uh, IL-6 is one of those inflammatory cytokines. You know, you know, one thing, Josh, that really I have not seen too much, and I'm surprised, and, and this comes to mind because my mom is on Humira, and that's, and that's another um, um, antibody that targets another one of these inflammatory molecules called, um, called TNF or tumor uh, necrosis factor, TNF. Um, but but it's, it, it's another one of those cytokines that's elevated during this um, overly active immune response and part of that cytokine storm. And I, and I wonder if people who, I mean, there are millions of people worldwide on Humira and Remicade and therapies that target uh, TNF. And I'm wondering if, if they fare better or not. I have not seen anything mentioned about that. Um, on, on one hand, you know, because TNF is important for fighting infections, you know, there could be an argument, hey, well, maybe it makes the infection worse, right? Maybe early, right? Because you can't fight the virus quite as well. But then on the flip side, maybe on later infections, it's actually a good thing. I don't, I don't know. And, and, you know, this also brings up something that I find just fascinating, Josh. There's like 20, 30% of people, right, that really show no symptoms or very little symptomology, right? 
And yet some of those people, they sample them by PCR and they have just screaming levels of virus. And yet they don't, they don't have any friggin' symptoms. How is, you know, just at, at its face, it doesn't make sense to me. And especially, um, that's, that, that, you're right, that's been the big news lately with um, kids going back to school because you say, well, the kids aren't getting sick. Well, but they are finding a lot of viral particles in these kids. Um, and so while the contact tracing isn't bringing it back to point at, um, at these younger kids as a, as a vector of transmission, it's, it's very concerning. Yeah. Um, I agree with you 100%. And yeah, definitely there's, and, and you mentioned T cell immunity. That's one thing that's been questioned that I've, that I've come across is that, um, well, maybe it's, you know, because we, we measure antibodies um, to see if you have antibodies against it, but it seems like maybe some people have, um, this more um, the other type of immunity um, coming from T cells that's that's really keeping them safe. So their their T cell function is really the main driver that's the, that's keeping them from being infected. Right. And do you know why? Like people always measure antibodies. Do you know why? By do you want to take a guess? Why? I'm sorry. What's the you you, you always hear about antibodies? You always hear about antibodies, right? Do you, do you want to take a guess as to why that is? What, you know you know for these studies. Um, because you can measure them. <laughs> yeah, you can measure them very easily. You can <laughs> yes. measure them very easily. It's just convenience. You know, it's, it's actually quite difficult to, to assay T cell responses. And so it's, it's hard to do. It, it's expensive. It takes a lot of time, special expertise. And so that And that's, yes. that is um, when we have kids that have immune problems, um, there's, the, that's what a lot of parents will come to me and say, um, you know, little John, he's always sick. Um, he's always sick. And you have to say, well, yeah, kids this age will get sick six to eight or um, 10 to 12 times per year at 10 days per illness. And that's a lot of sick days for anybody. Um, but then you really do have kids that are beyond that. And then they, you send them, I send them to the specialists, make sure that the right tests are done because you're right. It goes from goes from those tests, looking at the the simple ones, <laughs> the IgG, the IgA, the mm -hmm. IgM, the IgE, the IgG subclasses, and then it goes on to um, the the next test and the next test and the next test. And those those are, right. those are now um, I, I don't even know what the lineup is anymore um, because I'm sure it's much more advanced than um, um, than than 15 years ago when I was in my training and I was really um, really on top of how that worked but mm -hmm. I still send it to the specialist because that's what they do um, and and they they make sure that the appropriate test is done to look for the appropriate problem in the immune response right. which is what which is what one of the, the um, that study with there were two family members it was only a four patient study but um, I think it was two brothers two sets of brothers with with illness and and um, and it turned out the one the one set of brothers had an had a um, genetic mutation that that left them susceptible, um, okay. and and then um, there was they found some other stuff on the on the other brothers, but it, that's going to be a very small percentage of of all these cases. But maybe that's you know maybe that is part of the puzzle uh, as to why some people are are, are getting it and some people aren't. I, I really do think that's the that's actually probably the majority of the explanation is on the, the patient side, because as we mentioned before, the virus um, in the in the in the world of RNA viruses that have RNA genomes, this is this whole class of viruses, coronavirus, is the most um, uh, faithful, right? I mean, it has the, it has the lowest rates of of error, the lowest rates of mutation of all known RNA viruses, and so it's not mutating rapidly at all. And so if you infect a thousand people, right, with the same virus, the exact same nucleic acid sequence, you're gonna get a host of clinical outcomes, right? It's gonna be a range from infectious dose to where they get infected, how they get infected. Um, and then on top of that, like you mentioned, Josh, their genetic background, um, you know, it could be a lot of things, right? Including, including even like obesity, diabetes, like on top of, on top of other uh, of, of other genetic predisposition. So, um, I, I do I do think that it's mainly on the on the person side why we see such a range, not on the virus side. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about school age children. I mean, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently because we live in Boyertown School District and. 
um, districts everywhere are debating what, what to do, you know. I do think that people are being a little bit, just a little bit, um, what, what's, what's the word? Um, I, th I think some people are not being careful enough when they talk about transmission with, with kids. And you, you, you brought this up as well. Um, it's not as if kids have been shown to be not infected or they cannot transmit. It just seems that they infect at lower levels. But, you know, I mean, there's just a, a report from, I think, out of Georgia to sleep away camp. Yes. Like 100, 100, 100, like 160 some kids got infected. Um, out, of, out of 600 or something. Out of 600 something. Or and all of the, all of the um, uh, camp counselors and et cetera, all the adults were wearing masks at all times and the kids were not. So yeah, I think kids can transmit. I don't think they get as sick in general, right? I, I think that that's true. Um, but a lot of this data that came out about kids, you know, came down, you know, came out when, when we were all in a lockdown and school was canceled. Well, so of course, they're going to get infected less frequently. They're not at school, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. I, I like I this one, Adam. I'm sure you saw it because it was all over the place. But the CDC announces that fever, cough, shortness of breath are the three most common symptoms. Well, guess what? We, nobody, if you didn't have those symptoms, you couldn't get tested right. for the half of the pandemic so far. So, of course, those are going to be the most common symptoms. Right. And, and on top of that, that selection top bias is just unbelievable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. And, 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 that, and it all comes back to testing. Um, but, but you're right. I've read reports where um, young, you know, the younger you are, the less symptoms you, you tend to have. Like, you, like a lot of kids don't get fever, for example, with, with this virus. So, right. So, so early on, they would not have been recommended for testing. Right. So that's exactly what you just said. Um, so I think we missed some of that. Um, so, so, so now that we're on testing, um, this is something that I've, you know, over the last few months, like thinking about this, reading about this. I, I think some, some of our current PCR-based testing, I think is almost like too sensitive, if that makes sense. Um, so, so, so let me try to, um, let, let me try to do something real quick, if, if I can try to do this. Um, if I go to, Okay, so can you see my screen, Josh? Yes. So this is something that will hopefully make some sense for some people. So PCR-based testing, okay? It, it's a, um, the, the one that you hear about in the news all the time is a PCR-based test. And so the, um, the viral genome is made of RNA. And so what they do is they convert that to DNA in, in a tube, and then they do PCR from that. P PCR you have to do off of DNA, right? So you convert the genome of the virus, which is RNA, to DNA, and then you um, conduct PCR off of that. And I'm just gonna draw this very quickly here. So what you look for, so over on this axis over here is fluorescence, okay? And this, is, and this is called a, um, a real-time RT-PCR assay, okay? So it's in real-time, meaning you can watch, you can literally, if, if, if you're standing at the instrument, often you can see the results come in. And the RT here stands for reverse transcriptase. That's the enzyme that they use to convert the viral genome, the RNA, to DNA so you can do the PCR part of the assay. And early on, during this assay and so down here is called the cycle number okay um, so these are the cycles okay and fluorescence is so the more um, uh, fluorescence is given off the way the assay is set up the more product you have so initially what often is the case is you'll have this flat line for a while right it's below the limit of detection there's just not enough product built up yet to see any positivity. That dashed line that I'm drawing there would be, would be the threshold. And then eventually it'll come up like that. Okay. And this could be a CT, they call it a CT, cycle value threshold, CT value. This might be 36. Okay. Which is pretty far out. It's pretty far out on the curve. Now let's say um, somebody else, right, comes in 
and they might be flatline, 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 and then come up here, okay? And so that CT went basically where it crossed the threshold. Uh, let's say in this case, the CT value is um, 20, okay? Now, um, not to put you on the spot, Josh, but just to kind of have you know, somebody else jumped in here, what, which, one of those what, which one of those individuals, somebody who had a CT value of 20 or 36 is gonna have more virus? The 20. Right, right. And, that, and when, I, when I discussed this in my molecular genetics class, um, you know, for, for the student who really hasn't thought about this or, or, or read about it much, right, it, it's sort of this, this like, you know, it's this inverse relationship. But initially it doesn't make sense, right? You think, oh, the higher number, more virus, but it's, as you mentioned, it's actually 20. So that means that the person that had 20, they had more, um, they had more of the starting material. And so it took less cycles to reach the threshold. So they had more virus to start with, less cycles to reach the threshold. And so they come up sooner. Um, and so I, I bring up this whole like sensitivity issue because I've been reading a lot about this and, and uh, there's some work of um, uh, Daniel Griffith. He's an ID doc out of New York City. Uh, Michael Mina, um, Amina from, from Harvard, um, he's, he, he's like a nucleic acid expert, um, he has a lot of stuff on, on, on testing. And what's interesting is if you look in, if you look in this right here, right, people that are coming up positive, like 35, 36, 37 CT values, all the available data to date suggests that those people are no longer infectious anymore, okay? They're, they're still detectable RNA, there's still detectable genome there, but all evidence to date suggests that they are no longer infectious, okay? But they're still gonna come up PCR positive in our very, very sensitive, very stringent PCR tests that are kind of like the, the one that's the most commonly used. Whereas these people are the problem. These people that are coming up positive, um, cycle value you know, 16, 18, 20, 22, those are the people who are still um, that, you know, the higher amount of virus, those are probably the ones that are infectious, okay? Um, and, and so one of the things that I've come to appreciate and kind of um, my, my two cents is that some of the PCR-based testing, okay, is, is almost too sensitive. So if there was a test that was less sensitive, right, it, it's probably, you know, and, and of course you could, you could go through the regulatory approval and show this, but if there was like a, say, say like a dollar a day test, right, and you knew that it only picked up virus when it's at really high levels, right? But when it's at really, really low levels, it's not gonna pick it up. And I would say, who cares? Because you're not infectious anymore, right? I wanna know who has the most amount of virus and who's still probably the most infectious, right? So, so in, in, in my, in my um, you know, kind of paradise right now, you would have like a dollar a day test, a very a, a relatively low sensitivity test, that's gonna detect people with the highest amount of virus. And you can almost get the result like in say five minutes, right? Um, dollar a day and you know, give it to kids before they go to school or before you go to you know, like a, a kid in college, before you go to class or before somebody goes to work. And if you come back positive, then, then, then you don't go to school that day, you don't go to school, um, you, know, you, go to, uh, you, you, you don't go to work that day. And maybe you begin your like two week quarantine then, right? Um, but, but anyway, that's just, you know, that's just a little background on the test um, for, for people to hopefully you follow some of that. You can write in with questions if you have any. Um, but like I said, you know, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox for a moment, Josh, but that's kind of like my, my take on where we're at now with testing. Uh, I think the bar is too high um, for these tests, right? And in order for tests to be approved, it has to show like X amount of sensitivity and I'm wondering if, if it's just, if it's too high, the bar is too high and the tests are still too damn expensive. Um, so, so I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that, Josh. Um, I, I, I read a, a similar, uh, an, I read an article that said the exact same thing that you're saying. Um, and, and because that, from my understanding that um, there is the, they could make that test. Somebody can make that paper tests, like you said, for um, about a dollar a day, um, anywhere from uh, 90 cents up to $5, I think is, was the range, something like that. Um, a a paper, paper test that gives you a positive or a negative, um, almost 
almost like a home pregnancy test, um, except less, <laughs> even less, um, um, less bells and whistles. And then you're right, you could test every day and then we would be in really, really, really good shape. But these companies apparently are fearful to develop it because as you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the process to get approval is, um, takes a long time and is very, very expensive. And so they're fearful that um, with a low sensitivity that they won't get approval. Right. Um, and so um, I think you're right on the mark on that. And I think that is very interesting that these um, PCR tests, um, you know, we may have mentioned this before, but the panels that, um, that check, there are panels available for, um, so you can do a respiratory panel on a mm -hmm. patient that looks for 20, I think, it might be 20 different uh, viruses that cause respiratory illnesses. And so you do the same swab that patients are getting right now to check for COVID, you send it off to the lab and 24 to 48 hours later, you would get the result back. And I've had personal experience with lots of patients getting uh, multiple um, potential uh, positives back. <laughs> and you say, well, okay, um, you know, Susie doesn't have five different diseases going on. Susie probably just has rhinovirus. Um, but, you know, at some, somewhere along the line, she came across, um, you know, these other pathogens. Um, and, and it is scary sometimes because, because it, um, you can check for, um, um, for, for pathogens that cause meningitis, um, uh, pneumonia, um, more serious illnesses. And I'm always thankful when I would make the phone call to tell a parent what the results were when they would say that the patient was doing better. You say, okay, well, you know, then let's not worry about these other things. You just call me if anything else comes up. Right, right. It's like, you know, it's like 23 and Me. Um, yeah. You know, you get all this information. What does it mean, right? Um, right. You know, you have this, does, you know, this disease allele you're a carrier of, and then all of a sudden you get like freaked out about it. Or, or like you said, you might like, I mean, I think a certain po uh, percentage of the population I think it might even be something not insignificant, like 20% of the population we're, we're colonized with, with Neisseria, uh, meningitis, and we'll never get meningitis, but we, but we have it in our, you know, in low amounts in our airway. Um, and yeah, so it's one of those things that's like you get freaked out because of like this data overload. Right. Uh, so, yeah. But anyway, that's just, I, I don't know, that's just kind of my, you know, and, and I feel like it takes... Um, you know, probably coming down from the White House to the governors to everybody. But for some reason, I don't know why, but it all started and we've gone down this path and people in their mind, they have, you know, if it's not 99% sensitive, then, it, then it's not useful information. And I would argue that if you had a test that was say 70% sensitive, and if it missed the people that are like, you know, cycle number 36 and above, I, I, like I said before, I, I would argue, I don't care. Like they're, they're not going to be this, you know, the spreaders anymore. They've reached their peak. They're 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 post peak now, um, and it's the people that are that have high amount of virus that are that are going to uh, they're going to be spreading. Um, and by the way, we're talking like in in order to be a spreader, I've seen data suggesting that you need to have millions of particles um, per say like milliliter per volume of sample or whatever, like millions of of copies of RNA per per mil of sample. Um, we're we're talking a lot of virus, and that's. The other thing too about like studies that have looked at like say surface contamination, I don't think surface contamination should be discounted, but I do think that it's largely respiratory. Um, but you know, if, if they place experimentally some virus on some say cardboard, right, and let it sit, they're using the most sensitive PCR based test possible to then try to sample that cardboard to see if the virus is still there, right? And lo and behold, it is for a certain amount of time, right? But is that enough virus like that the hundred or a thousand particles that are on that cardboard? I, I, my gut tells me no. Um, that's not to say that, you know, if someone who had high amounts of virus just touched a doorknob, right. And then you touched it and then you put it in your face or, you know, or in your eye or something, that's not to say it's impossible to get it through, through surface contamination. You just have to be careful. Um, but I still think that it's not like the major driver of this. Um, so, and you mentioned um, you mentioned the cost of a uh, of that test. Just so that our viewers know, um, the the current tests about one hundred and ten dollars for uh, for that PCR test. So, 
Um, just too expensive for somebody to get that on a regular basis. Yes. You know? yes. But, but really, in order for us to, to, to come to the other side on this, I think it all comes back to testing. Um, if you knew before you went to work that day whether or not you're positive, then you just stay home and you quarantine for two weeks, uh, you know, let's say. And I really think if we were testing more, we could beat this thing down relatively quickly. Um, but that's not what, that, that has not happened. And it doesn't seem to, to be making a rapid progress on that front. And it's very frustrating for me. So now I'm thinking, Adam, that we, if one of our viewers would like to invest, I'd like to go together um, with you. And let's, let's, let's just say we missed COVID and, and we missed that entirely, but I'm thinking flu. Uh, and let, let's go for it. Let's go for it. All right. Yeah, you, you, can, you can be the face of, uh, you know, you can be like the doctor right in the commercials, right? They put on the lab coat and the scrubs and they look all official, right? And yeah. I'll, just be the, I'll, I'll just be the lab grunt working on the, in, in the lab. <laughs> and then you know it, it always goes the medical establishment doesn't want you to know they're keeping you sick <laughs> right right right, and, right exactly and then we have the be... answer we're gonna make you well with our paper flu yeah. test <laughs> you know and then at the end of the ad there's that like speed talker right who does like uh auction he's an auctioneer right doing all like the contraindications at the end of the ad yeah <laughs> the fda has not approved any of these for any treatment this is not meant to diagnose or treat I thought they just said they diagnose it. <laughs> if, you have, if you've been ingrown toe, don't, you know, ingrown toenail, don't, don't take this medication. Oh, man. Uh, so, so we have a few minutes left. Um, what are some things that we haven't touched on yet that, that might be useful for, for our first kind of episode back in a while? Transmission, like I mentioned, fo you know, fomite surfaces. I think it, it's not insignificant, but I don't, you know, think it's even close to a major thing. Um, I was reading something that, uh, when, and once again, some of this is coming from, uh, like I said, I, I follow um, uh, Daniel Griffith quite a bit. Uh, he's an ID doc. Um, he's been in the trenches uh, treating people for, from the beginning in New York City on this. And he's been highlighting some research. It seems that, to, from what I'm gathering, that, well, number one, we still don't know what size respiratory droplets this is on. Is it on the really big guys that are gonna fall to, fall to the ground quickly? Or is it on the very, very, very small ones, almost like aerosols that are going to stay in the air for longer? I still haven't seen a definitive answer on that. Have you, Josh, seen anything definitive yet on that? No, and I, I think that um, eventually we're going to come to the point where we say that um, that, that that spectrum is not a dichotomy between yeah. an aerosol and a droplet. And, right. and I, think it, right. I think it will change the way we um, talk about that and the way we look at it. Think, for, a good, yeah. for a good thing, I think it's a much, I think, you know, all the, all the work that um, people are doing with fluid dynamics and all, all that stuff that, that um, you know, you, you read about and, and, and the masks, you know, what masks are working, what aren't. Um, I think that's a lot of good information that's going to come out of this uh, for the future. Right. Um, what's your take on the r not? Why, why do we have an r not that was five in certain areas and now it's down to less than one when we don't think we have enough people infected? And we don't really think they're mitigating as well as, I mean, did it really work that well? Did it not? Is it really the mass? What, what do you think? I, I think that I'm, I'm interested for your take on that. I'm, I think it's all the above, Josh. I mean, I think, I, I saw a recent survey that about 50% of people in this country are wearing a mask on a regular basis, according to the self-reported survey. And by the way, it's a shame that this has come, come out on some sort of political lines on this issue. It drives me bonkers. Right. But like the whole mask thing, um, you know, wear, just wear a mask. I mean, there are studies that show that it reduces transmission. Um, but I think, Josh, that just awareness, distancing, wearing a mask, I think that has helped, right? But it's also so frustrating because, because yeah, you're right, the R-naught, like, you know, so how many people does one person infect, right? So an R-naught of five means that one person infects five people. You know, in order for this thing to quote unquote flatten the curve, it, it, you have to have an R naught of less than one, right? So that one person is infecting on average less than one person. I mean, that's the definition of a, of a line going down. Um, I do think the mass have helped. I think awareness, distancing, um, but it's also very frustrating because if, if we had now testing in, into that, right? If we had widespread testing, true widespread testing, along with the other things that we just mentioned, I think within a month or less, this thing would go way down, right? Way down. 
and um, which, which you're seeing, which we're seeing in some countries, you right, know, which you're seeing. And, and so that Italy has been doing great. Um, Korea, yep. South Korea. Um, yeah. yeah. So and that's makes it makes me even more frustrated. Um, you know, do your part. It, it's, it's sort of just like, you know, helping out your fellow brother and sister, you know, your fellow citizen, you know, wear the mask, you're protecting yourself as well as helping to protect other people. You know, it's, it's basically for the public good. And it's not as if there's no evidence suggesting that, that it doesn't work. You know what I mean? Um, so. And it is, I think it's, it, it's easy. You know, I live over in Oli. Um, it's easy. Oli, Boyertown. I, I can social, I, I socially distant all the time. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I've never lived in New York City. I've never lived in downtown Philadelphia, Baltimore, where I, but I get it. Um, you know, if your house is, you know, 500 square feet, your apartment, and you live there with two or three people, yeah. or you live with nine or 10 other people, yeah. then yeah, you can social distance. And if, and if half of those, half of that group is an essential worker, and they're being exposed, and they're riding the bus and the subway, that's not easy. Um, but you're right. Uh, everybody else should be like, for, especially for those of us that can. Um, and, and then places like New York, uh, you know, they, they went through it and, and they're knock on wood doing very well now. And, and, um, but it's just, it's just a shame that it's, um, that it's hit every area. Like, like I mentioned in our meeting today, I, I'm, I'm fearful about St. Louis is our next, you know, the next, the next big one, I'm afraid um, to, to fall because, you know, all these inner city areas are just, they get somebody eventually brings it in and it, it just it takes hold right and you mentioned about the crowded household and you're right it's it's you know like whether it's multi-generational or whatever um you know it's we, we can't all live like you know locked up in our own rooms all the time right like you said if you're a central worker you got to go out and do do that job and and you're those people play an important role for our society right now right um but hopefully if they're wearing the mask and washing their hands and doing all of that while they're out and about, it should theoretically greatly reduce their risk of getting it to then take it home with them. So as long as they're doing those practices at their job, I would I would think that it would help re you know greatly reduce the you know the risk of that happening. I think think that is happening in some areas because um, there are some highly densely populated areas that it, it's not really spreading that much. Um, right. So anyway. Um, I mean, I think we touched on, on, on a lot today. Um, there'll be certainly more stuff to give updates about. I think if you're okay with it, I was thinking maybe once every like two to three weeks throughout the fall, you know, as different data come in about vaccine trials or, you know, uh, some study about this or that. Um, but hopefully we're still in our offices for these future meetings because I don't want to go back to being like on lockdown or anything like that. Um, so <laughs> I hope so. We've been in good shape here in uh, Berks County, so hopefully things stay that way um, as as we get back to campus and um, and um, the the school districts open up and everything else. Yeah. But we'll see. Yeah, that's going to be uh, a uh, experiment of sorts, right? We're we're, we're going to see that experiment going on very quickly. Um, Boyertown. Um, I guess I'll I I will keep it. I'll keep my comments to myself. Um, I mean, they're, we're running the gambit in this area, right? This area of the country is very interesting. We have some districts who are online only. Um, we have some districts who uh, are like Boyertown that are uh, four days in person, full days. And other districts are five days, full days. Um, some are doing two days on, three days, uh, um, um, three days online. So we'll see, right? This is literally an experiment going on and we'll see how um, infections are going and, and kids getting infected and all those things. Um, I hope for the best, you know, knock on wood. I think there's some real wood in my desk somewhere. <laughs> it's, it made a particle board. It's got, yeah, it's real wood there somewhere. Um, so anyway, yeah, we'll, it, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but, you know, anyway, I, I mentioned this at our one pandemic task force it's very frustrating when you know, once again about the masks and why this has become such an issue. I have no idea. And it's a shame that there are parents who are just so against their kids wearing a mask at school that they're because of HIPAA and, you know, uh, health policies, 
Um, they're saying, you know, my kid it cannot wear a mask uh, for some condition, I suppose. And um, due to HIPAA, you can't ask for any documentation or proof. And therefore, my kid is not going to wear a mask during school. And I, I don't know what's going to be like in my daughter's room. Um, but we want her to wear a mask. We want her to go back to school. We also want everyone to stay healthy and safe. And so I would say for any district out there, whoever, whoever's listening to this, probably not many, right? But I would say, um, and I voiced my opinion to the Boyertown School Board through email, but you know they get inundated with so many emails. I would say, if you can't wear a mask, then you, should, then you must wear a face shield at least, right? Because a face shield is not going to impair breathing, okay? but it might help reduce the spread of it. And, 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 and so I would say, if, if you can't wear a mask legitimately, then you have to wear a face shield. And if you can't wear either, then you should have to stay home. Because if, if you can't wear either of those things, you really shouldn't be exposed to the virus anyway, because then clearly you must have some sort of like respiratory medical condition where you would not want to get infected with this to begin with. So why are you even at school or at work, right? If you can't do a mask or a face shield. Uh, so that's sort of my little. I agree 100%. That's, um, that's, always, that's always a big thing uh, when it comes up. Well, no, wait a second. If they can't wear it, then they're really high risk. And so they need to not be here. We don't want them to get sick. Like, if you have a legitimate respiratory condition where it impairs your breathing, why would you want to get a respiratory infection? And, and and we can look back at the tapes. You know, I uh, I was didn't think masks were going to do anything. You know, but it looks like they are. I was wrong. You know, and and so um, now we have better information. So yeah, let's move exactly. forward. I agree exactly. with you. Move forward and 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 let's move for, forward even further. You know, okay, three ply mask. Well, what material? You know, how much benefit? How does it have to fit? You know, you try a different mask on. You say, oh, this one fits terribly. And and right. you know. So um, there's a lot of work that could be done to move us in the forward direction instead of going back to, like you said, you know, coming up with excuses to, to, to just not, not do what's the best thing for everybody, really. And I just want to let people know, I'm going back teaching in person, all right? I'm not, I'm not staying at home, okay? And, and pe some people can. They have a medical condition or they're, they're yeah. you know, some professors might be, you know, at, in, in an age group where they're more at risk. And so I would say, by all means, stay at home. I'm not in one of those risks that I, you know, risk groups that I know of. I don't have any pre-existing conditions I'm aware of. And I want to get back in the classroom and I'm going to try to do that, you know, but I'm going to wear a mask the whole time and all those things. So I'm in the hallway, walking around, I'm going to have a mask on, right? Um, I'm going to, you know, we're, we're trying to be smart about it, be safe about it, you know, but I do think life has to go on. And how do we get life to go on? Wearing a face mask, wash your hands, you know, um, distancing, and testing, you know, that, that's how we can have a normal economy and a, and a relatively normal life and try to, and try to get past this thing. Um, and unless, unless people buy in on those things, it's, we're just gonna, it's just gonna linger and linger and linger. And like you said before, what a tidal wave of molasses. Okay? So maybe we should end on that note. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, well, I'll reconnect with you, Josh, in like like two weeks, and uh, and we maybe you know we'll do an update or something. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Adam. All right, Josh. It's good to All see right. you. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye. Bye now.